This video is sponsored by InVideo AI. Who here hasn't been to space? How much would you pay to go into space? I suppose I should clarify that because going to space can be anywhere from a few minute suborbital hop to a multi month stay at the Hotel ISS. So let's say orbital, three days, small capsule. There's a bathroom, but uh, otherwise no privacy. You'll have to undergo weeks of rigorous training and meet stringent physical and emotional requirements. It will be uncomfortable and you may permanently damage your body but you would get to see the entire Earth held before you in your gaze. You just might transform your entire outlook on life and humanity. You can briefly look down on all of us peons from your orbital vantage point. And for the rest of your life, you get to say you've been to space, which is pretty awesome. How much would you pay? Well, that question is fast becoming a reality for many people with the continued rise in space tourism which is wildly enough a thing in humanity. So I'd like to take some time this episode to look at space tourism, go through a brief history, look at some major selling points and some not so great sides to it. And then we can decide if any amount of money is worth going into space for and if anyone should bother doing it at all. Before I dig into how there is more to the story, I want to tell you about the process of content creation. A lot of people have been asking me about how to get started in science communication, and that's where InVideo AI comes in. InVideo AI is the world's most popular AI video creator with over 10 million users across more than 150 countries. And coming soon is its newest update, the game-changing InVideo AI version 3. Integrating generative capabilities, InVideo AI V3 will allow you to create videos from scratch about any topic you can think of. Check this out. All you need to do is provide a simple text prompt. Let's try a make me a long video about the 10 most incredible wonders of India and their history. India is a land of extraordinary contrasts. Join me as we uncover 10 of the most incredible wonders this land has to offer. From there, you can get creative and fine tune your video using just text prompts in ways you'd never have imagined. For example, you can type, show the artisans working on the Taj Mahal, and there you have it, exactly the scene you were looking for. You can even use the voice cloning feature. Check this out. Change the narrator to my voice. The Taj Mahal, more than just a tomb, is a poem in marble, a love story whispered through the ages. Pretty cool, right? You can try InVideo AI version 2 for free, but if you are serious about video creation, you should get a paid plan that starts at just $20 a month. And it will remove the watermark, give you access to millions of royalty-free stock footage clips, and give you access to the voice cloning feature, all of which would cost you hundreds of dollars individually. Just go to the link in the description and use my code to get twice the number of video generation credits in your first month. All right, let's get back to the story. So let's start with the history. Uh, the wonderful world of space tourism is generally regarded to begin in 2001 when an American business dude named Dennis Tito paid a cool 20 mil to the company Space Adventures. And Space Adventures act like a middleman. Originally, they were working with the Russian space agency to send people up to Mir, and then that kind of fell through. And so they switched over and they worked out a deal with NASA and Dennis got to visit the International Space Station for a week. Over the years, six other people from various walks of very wealthy life have joined him, paying tremendous sums of money for a few days stay at a, well, it's not exactly the Ritz Carlton, but you can't beat the views. But in my reckoning, and this is my show, so I get to do whatever kind of reckoning I want, space tourism started way earlier. Yeah, Dennis Tito is the first person to have a, uh, let's call it a purely transactional relationship with NASA. Dennis paid the money, did all the training, got certified, went to the ISS, did some science experiments, and came back home. No lists, no competitions, no government sponsorships, just cold, hard cash. But going all the way back to 1984, NASA was including, quote, payload specialists in their flight rosters. These were people not employed by NASA, 
not given the full suite of training that NASA astronauts get, and they were generally representatives of various contracting companies. And they aren't generally considered space tourists because they weren't paying the bills themselves. And they had some minor role to play in the mission, like babysit a satellite before the shuttle deployed the satellite in orbit. But, you know, the, the line's a little blurry here, so I say space tourism goes back to 1984, but not many people listen to me. You can disagree with me if you want. Uh, but then after that, NASA even set up programs for us regular folks to go into space. They had a teacher in space competition, an artist in space competition, a journalist in space competition. They even had a politician in space thing. Uh, they didn't call it that. They just invited members of Congress to go on space missions. I guess the idea was if they got to go to space themselves, they might be more willing to approve future budget requests. Um, that plan didn't exactly work out, but that's a different story. All of these name that profession in space uh, programs ended abruptly with the Challenger disaster in 1986, but uh, they did a few. The 1990s saw a major shift in NASA's thinking. Prior to the 1990s, the NASA's thinking was, there's no way we're going to dirty our hands with private individuals paying us money to get seats on launches. And in the by the end of the 1990s, this shifted to we might be open to dirtying our hands with private individuals paying us money to get seats on launches. And if you're wondering what motivated that change in thinking, I'll give you a clue. The clue begins with the letter B and it ends with Ujit. And so you end up in 2001 with folks like Dennis Tito going up in space by just paying cash and having no other reason to be there. Russian space agency finally got along on the gig. They also let some paying customers go up to the Mir space station. But all of this ended with the end of the shuttle program in 2011. And that's because the space shuttle has lots of seats, so it's easy to buy a seat. And once that program ended, NASA was sending all its astronauts up on Soyuz capsules, which don't have a lot of seats and they were buying up every single spot for their own astronauts and there wasn't any room left. And so it seemed in 2011, like that was the end of the story for space tourism. You know, a handful of folks got to go to the space station, but now there weren't enough seats to just hand out like candy and that was that. Space tourism was a cute side diversion that lasted a few years and a few people went up and then that's it. And then private space flight happened. Now, I don't know the actual history, the backroom conversations, the negotiations and so on. But what I like to imagine is that a bunch of billionaires wanted to pull a Dennis Tito and go play astronaut and asked NASA for a seat to the space station. But NASA shrugged and said, sorry, without a space shuttle, there aren't enough seats and, and you can't go. And so the billionaires went back to their corner and decided that if NASA wasn't going to let them be astronauts, then they were going to make their own space agency with their own rockets and be astronauts all on their own. Hell yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's basically what happened. We have Elon Musk starting SpaceX. We have Jeff Bezos starting Blue Origins. We have Richard Branson with Virgin Galactic. All independent, privately funded space companies. And that deserves an entire episode on its own, the emergence of private spaceflight, go feel free to ask. I would love to discuss it more in depth. But of the three of them, of SpaceX, Blue Origins, and Virgin Galactic, only Virgin Galactic has a stated long-term goal of space tourism. The entire point of Virgin Galactic is space tourism. The other, SpaceX and Blue Origins, they allow space tourism or they have short-term space tourism goals like, we're gonna do space tourism now, but it's going to lead to something else in the future. They have very different long-term goals, like the stated goal of SpaceX is to get us to Mars, and we need to talk about that, feel free to ask. And the state of, stated goal of Blue Origins is to develop industry off the Earth, and, and we, we also need to talk about that, so feel free to ask. But whether it's stated goal, long-term goal, short-term goal, or just side hustle, all three of these companies have either directly or through various partnerships brought Taurus into space. And the big year for this was 2021. It, it technically started in 2004, Scale Composites, a company called Scale Composites, which would eventually become and merge to become Virgin Galactic, achieved a suborbital flight just above the 
von Karman line, which is an arbitrary line where we say space starts. It's 100 kilometers up. So that was technically private astronauts going into space. Uh, but then Virgin Galactic did it again with passengers just along for the ride in 2021. Also in 2021, we had the Inspiration4 mission, which was funded by yet another billionaire, which spent three days in orbit on a SpaceX capsule. And in 2021, we had Blue Origin's New Shepard rocket reach an altitude of 107 kilometers with four passengers, four people who were just along for the ride. So in 2021, all of a sudden, we have a whole bunch of people just paying their way to private companies to get into space. And that was two decades after Dennis Tito. And it really reignited this conversation about space tourism because now you don't have to negotiate with a government space agency to get your ticket. You just buy one. Like you'd log into your airline's website and pick up a couple tickets to visit Grandma in Boise for the weekend and you should totally visit Grandma in Boise. All right, she misses you. So now that the era of space tourism is here in a much more real way than it was with the handful of flights that happened in years and decades prior, we have to grapple with it. It's happening. It's probably going to keep happening. But is this happening a good thing? Should we keep doing this thing? Well, on the good side of space tourism, there's there's a long list. For example, some of the astronauts, not all of them, but some of these private astronauts, and yes, there's a whole side discussion about whether we even call these people astronauts or whether we call them commercial astronauts or we call them <clears throat> space flight participants. Um, that's a whole separate discussion. I'm not getting into that. Some of these astronauts, people going into space, are doing actual science experiments. They're looking at the effects of space flight on human health. They're looking at the effects of weightlessness on plant growth, the effects of zero G on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash PM Sutter. Um, I don't personally have any great dreams of going into space. I would do it like if if all of you Patreon subscribers pooled your money and bought me a $20 million ticket, I would probably take it. Um, but I'm not counting on that. And I'm just grateful for every single contribution you make, whether it gets me into space or not. That's patreon.com slash PM Sutter. They are also looking at uh, various material science questions like the properties of micro bubbles in zero G, uh, tensile strength, so on. Like, like there are a lot of experiments that can only be done in zero G that can't be replicated in a laboratory on Earth and are essential for our future understanding of how to live and work in space. Uh, we need to know how zero G affects biological systems, plant growth. Like, can we can we grow a tomato in space and it tastes good? And can, can we digest it? And can our body systems adapt to zero G? And can we build new materials um, that can only be grown in zero G or developed in zero G, bring them back to Earth and they're really useful or we keep them in space and they're useful in space. There are like a million questions we need to answer about how to live and work in space. And there are experiments being done uh, by these space tourists to do exactly that. And the endeavor of space tourism is driving more commercial interest and money in space. It's a legit business venture, right? There are accountants and profit and loss statements and marketers and spreadsheets. Who doesn't love a good spreadsheet? I mean, this is a legit business. And, and one argument you can make about space is the more the merrier, the more people that are going into space, the more companies that are interested in space, the more organizations that are developing partnerships, technologies. It's just the more things that happen in space, the better for everyone. And it's an excuse to develop technologies that may have many other uses. Like if you're going to develop a rocket to send tourists into space, well, then you end up with a rocket that can send other things into space. Uh, equipment, probes, missions, science experiments, uh, people not going for tourism, but for industry to do other things like we're just making that technology. And hey, with all these companies developing space tourism, developing reusable rockets, developing clever ways to get into space, that makes access to space overall cheaper because you have more people competing, developing technologies, finding clever solutions that lessens the cost of getting into space overall. 
and who knows what you're going to get when you have cheap access to space. And you can argue that um, space tourism is driving more public interest in space. There's a lot of media coverage. Uh, whenever there's a private space launch, you know, the media gets interested because it's just folks going up. I mean, William Shatner went into space. How meta can you get? Um, that's, that's what you do. You, lots of people talking about space, dreaming about space, thinking about space. I'm literally talking about it, devoting an entire episode to space tourism. Uh, and we're having this conversation. People like to dream, especially about fancy, expensive, rich person stuff. Like, oh man, if I had $20 million spare sitting in my, shoved in my couch cushions, yeah, I think I'd like to go to space. And that kind of dream can fuel creativity and careers. That's pretty awesome. And who knows what creative people will think of when they're sparked by thoughts of space. And then there's this overview effect, something that many, many astronauts have talked about, that once you remove yourself from the planet Earth and you see the how fragile we are, how small we are, how precious we are, and you don't see any lines drawn in the ground to separate one country from another and all of our arguments and squabbles and, and wars seem so small and insignificant and even petty and like there's an argument to be made that the more people we send to space whether they're doing work or not or just going along for the ride that they had come back to earth with a sense of community and humanity and vulnerability and they can spread this message uh, to the rest of us and more people feeling a sense of community and humanity vulnerability um is generally better for humanity in some intangible way. Okay, that's the good stuff. What about the downsides to space tourism? Well, the vast majority of space tourists have not done any science experiments. Uh, by far the most successful company in terms of number of human beings sent into space is Virgin Galactic, and these are quick suborbital hops lasting like 10, 20 minutes tops. Um, they're not doing any science experiments. They're just along for the ride. They're enjoying the view and they're coming back to Earth. Only a small fraction of space tourists are conducting experiments. And those experiments aren't, I hate to say this, all that impressive. I'm not trying to dog the researchers who develop the experiments here. Obviously, any experiment is useful. Obviously, we do learn things. Obviously, we do gain some understanding. But it's not like we're doing a ton of research with space tourists. And the experiments we're doing, they're not exactly groundbreaking. And they're not exactly experiments that can't be done in other venues like the International Space Station. Yeah, there's only so many experiments we can do on the ISS, that's for sure. And so the more venues we have, the better. But it's not exactly like a lot. We're not really changing the, the future of experimentation, the few humanity in space angle with the handful of experiments we've been able to do. And I have a sneaking suspicion. This is just between you and me. Uh, so NASA for a while had a program where you could get wings, astronaut wings that you could wear on your shirt or your backpack or whatever. And I mean, if I had astronaut wings, I would wear the 24 seven, let's be honest. And part of the certification to get those wings is that you had to involve yourself in some sort of experiment that advanced our knowledge of human spaceflight. That program went away a couple years ago. And so I wonder if now that you can't get your wings anymore, um, you're not going to bother doing any experiments. So uh, that's just that's just curious speculation. We'll see where that goes or if space tourism just leans into. Yeah, we're just here for the view, which is fine, but it's not exactly advancing our scientific understanding of human spaceflight. Another downside to it is it's just a bunch of billionaires wasting money. Like you're building entire rockets, entire technology, entire companies from the ground up just so some ultra wealthy people can spend a few minutes in space and look down on us and then come back. Can't that money? Is that wise money? Is that money that could have been spent on, you know, literally anything else? This can create a sense of disillusion. Like, great. Rich people doing stupid rich things uh, that doesn't benefit us. 
and it can ironically make space feel even more distant. At least the astronauts were, I mean, they were superhumans and they they are superhumans, but they're regular folks, right? They, they live down the street. Your only qualification to be an astronaut is you have to be super smart and super physically fit, but like otherwise you're a normal person. You're not separated by wealth and just having rich people go into space it makes it feel like more of just a playground, inaccessible, something we can't get to. Us normal folks will never go into space, so why bother? And so it's hard for the public to really see the value in what private space tourists are doing. Like, great, I'm glad you're having a good time. In an image that comes to my mind, and I just have to roll my eyes every time, I'm very sorry, is when Jeff Bezos went in the the new Shepard rocket suborbital flight for a while. They were weightless in the videos come back of, of the capsule and they're sitting there. They're not looking out the windows. All right, see if you can catch this in your mouth. They're not contemplating the meaning of existence and the role of humanity. Who wants a Skittle? They're like throwing candy at each other. And that kind of image is was personally very off putting. And I suspect off putting to a lot of people like, great, you spent how many? billions of dollars so that you could throw candy at each other. Ah, it, it, it can leave a sour taste in some people's mouth, especially if the candy was like sour gummies or something. And as for the overview effect, okay. Are any of the space tourists like better people? Maybe, maybe not. Is there any solid evidence, especially among the billionaire class when a billionaire went into space, enjoyed the view, got the overview effect that did they did they come back a better person? I don't know. And it should be noted that the overview effect is not universal. William Shatner, when he went up, faced profound existential dread. Black ugliness. He, he did not have a rosy picture of our place in the universe when he came back. So it's not like everyone comes back with the same perspective. And space tourism is nice, but does it really advance human spaceflight in our spread into space and, and, and uh, industry in space? Uh, further exploration, potential uh, colonization of other worlds. Is it really leading to that or is it a distraction? We're spending time, money and resources on a niche business venture that only a tiny fraction of humanity gets to enjoy. And so we're spending time, money and resources on a business venture that may go nowhere. Yeah, there may be some technology side benefits and ways to advance overall human spaceflight as a byproduct of space tourism? Maybe not. The directions we're taking in space tourism may not be transferable to other more useful avenues. And, you know, we can't ignore the pollution, the space junk. Every launch adds to the, you know, the overall carbon footprint, adds to the overall CO2. You know, it, it, it's, it's not for free. And then every launch, there's even the reusable stuff. There are some parts that are not reused. This is contributing to space junk, more bits and bolts, more crowding of low Earth orbit with with all these people playing tourist. Um, yeah, it's not we don't get it for free. Everything comes with a cost. OK, so we've done the good side, the bad side. Now for the boring side. The truth is uh, it's hard. Space tourism is hard. It's hard for companies to do it and succeed. The list of space tourism companies that have failed is much, much longer than the list of companies that have succeeded. Here are just a few. Uh, space Adventures hasn't done much of anything since the end of the shuttle program. There are companies like Armadillo Aerospace, x -Core Aerospace. I've never heard of these either before I started researching this episode. They were developing suborbital rockets that folded. Bigelow Aerospace had an idea for inflatable space hotels, even had a module attached to the ISS. The company folded. Stuff is just sitting around. I've seen parts of it over at Goddard Space Flight Center. They're just there, not doing anything. There's the Inspiration Mars Foundation, which was founded by Dennis Tito, where volunteers would go to Mars that actually went nowhere. There was the Dear Moon project where, you know, some random billionaire is going to take artists and, and influencers and we're going to orbit, go around the moon and then come back. And that went nowhere. It turns out that it's easy to develop an idea and it's easy to announce that idea. But space itself is really, really hard. Most space tourism companies are not going to deliver on their promises. 
It's also personally hard, like on a physical level. Spaceflight, spaceflight kind of sucks. The physical experience of it, the prep is physically demanding. Your body gets all messed up. Weightlessness is actually very uncomfortable. You have to fight nausea, there's bloating, you have weird things happen to your sinuses, there might be permanent damage to your vision, to your bones, to your heart. Yeah, it's not friendly on the human body. And it's rare. Space tourism is rare. It's only what, like 60 space tourists total? Most of them, vast majority of them have been suborbital. The vast majority of them have only spent, you know, tens of minutes in space. Space tourism launches only happen a few times a year at most, and it will not get significantly more frequent over the coming years. So what's the verdict? After summarizing all these arguments, all these facets, all these angles, here's my take. Paul Sutter's personal hot take. Are you ready? Meh. That's right. Meh. Hear me out. Hear me out. To me. I'm speaking very personally here. After surveying all these angles myself, I find space tourism kinda interesting. To me, space tourism isn't moving the needle much in any direction. I sincerely doubt that I will ever get the chance to be a space tourist. And yeah, I would take the opportunity if I if it was presented to me, but I don't think I'll get the opportunity. I don't see the costs coming down all that much over the coming decades. I think it will remain a leisure activity for the ultra rich, which is fine, I guess. I mean, I'm not going to ask too many questions about how other people spend their money because I don't want too many questions asked about how I spend my money, mostly cheese. So whatever. And yes, companies are developing the capabilities to do it, but most of these companies have failed. And the most successful one, Virgin Galactic, in terms of the number of ticketed passengers accessing space, isn't all that much different than a high altitude balloon trip. And yeah, experiments are being done, but not a lot. And nothing that can't be done in other venues. And there is much more long term interest in other commercial aspects of space, like mining asteroids or deploying mega constellations of communication satellites, which we need to talk about running theme in this episode, so just ask. Companies like Blue Origins and SpaceX, like SpaceX is by far the most successful private spaceflight company. Yes, they allow space tourism. People can buy seats on launches, on capsules, um, but that is not their primary goal. Their primary goal is industrialism, you know, putting stuff in space. Blue Origins, has a short-term goal of space tourism, and they've done some space tourism flights, but that's not their long-term goal. And then Virgin Galactic, their stated goal is space tourism, uh, and they just have quick suborbital flights that pop you into space, you know, get you above the Von Karman line so it counts, and then bring you back down like a giant roller coaster. There isn't actually much industry interest in space tourism. And so to me, space tourism isn't a game changer. It will continue to be a thing in space, but I don't think it will ever be the thing in space. And after listening to all these arguments and back and forth, you may have your own hot take, and that's great. And you may think that I overemphasized some points or downplayed others, and that's great too. I think it's a worthy debate to have. I mean, ultimately, (laughs) these super rich people are going to do whatever they want. They're going to do super rich things and they may spend billions upon billions upon billions of dollars so that they can get a joy ride into space, either de- just buying a ticket or developing the company from the ground up. But and, and, and truth be told, there's not much we can do about, but we can make our approval known. We can make our disapproval known. We can make our apathy known. I would love it if more people got into space. I think overall it would be a good thing. Uh, But space tourism, I don't think is how we're going to do it. And I don't see it as a major component of our humanity's future in space for the coming decades or even centuries. I think it will happen more, but I think it will happen as a byproduct of other things. The more we are in space, the more we explore space, the more things we do in space, the more tourists are going to find ways to to hop along for the ride. And that's fine, but it's also just fine. And we can still wonder if we were given the chance 
how much we'd be willing to pay. I still think about that. Thank you to at True Atomic Snails for the question that led to today's episode. And thank you to all your wonderful questions. Please keep those questions coming. That's askaspaceman at gmail.com or you can visit the website askaspaceman.com. There's a form there where you can also check out all the old episodes. I can't thank you enough for all the questions. The questions are the lifeblood of this show and, and it is a joy to get your questions every single time. And I can't thank my Patreon supporters enough for keeping this show going. That's patreon.com slash PM Sutter. I'd like to give a shout out to the top contributors this month. We've got Justin G, Chris L, Lothian53, Barbara K, Alberto M, Duncan M, Corey D, Stargazer, Robert B, Tom G, Nyla, Bike Santa, Sam R, John S, Joshua, Scott M, Rob H, Lewis M, John W, Alexis, Gilbert M, Rob W, Valerie H, Demetheus J, Jules R, Mike G, Jim L, Scott J, David S, Angelo L, William W, Scott R, Dean C, Miguel, BBGJ108, Barley Wires, Heather, Mike S, Michelle R, Pete H, Steve S, Nathan, and Wat Wat Bird. Thank you so much. Please keep those questions coming. Please drop a review on iTunes. That really helps the show visibility as always, or however you get this podcast. And I will see you next time for more complete knowledge of time and space.